Hello, good morning everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. It's a bit of a tough follow-up back after that brilliant presentation, but I'll give it a go. Um, so yeah, I'm Cash. I've been at Fortinet for um, probably too long. But yeah, it's quite a brief presentation in regards to threat intelligence. Um, really, over the, so I'm lucky enough to work with the Fortinet threat intelligence team. I have done for the last decade or so. And I'm also fortunate enough to cover EMEA and APAC. So I get a lot of, vis well, my, my team get a lot of visibility in regards to um, what's generally happening across the threat landscape. So the presentation itself is quite straightforward. We've seen a lot of transition um, and a bit of a spoiler alert in regards to the way the presentation is going to go. We've seen threat intelligence kind of move from a reactive model to being totally proactive to actually be able to cope with the current threat landscape. So we're going to focus on, you know, first of all, why that's happened and then what's actually been done to actually um, kind of evolve to the Evolve, uh, changing threat landscape. So just to give you a bit of confidence you know, in regards to Fortinet and um, our background uh, in threat intelligence, so obviously Fortinet was, as an organization was founded in about 2000. The FortiGuard labs are basically our threat, retail, uh, threat research labs. Um, not only do we do a lot of uh, investigations uh, with different uh, agencies across the world, but the FortiGuard labs also produce the update for our products as well. So if you are a Fortinet user, the updates that you receive on average on a, you know, once a minute, but if there's an emerging threat, it could be anything up to um, even five or 10 updates in a minute or within 30 seconds. Those updates are actually produced in-house by FortiGuard and pushed out to our solutions. Um, we have a product set, obviously, that ranges from the kernel level of the operating system with EDR all the way up to uh, public and public cloud workloads, but we don't see ourselves as the one silver bullet in cybersecurity. And a good testament to that is the Cyber Threat Alliance. So the Cyber Threat Alliance was actually set up with our fierce competitors, Palo Alto, Checkpoint, McAfee, and Symantec back in 2014. So, um, and that wasn't just a nice piece of paper where everyone says, okay, we're going to work together. That is actually a hard technical framework where the vendors actually share malware databases and threat information. So that's massively expanded now. So Cisco and I think another at least 20 members have actually joined that. And that Cyber Threat Alliance is actually the, well, the information in the Cyber Threat Alliance is actually ingrained into <coughs> these solutions and products as well. So if you're using any of our products for any type of advanced threat analytics, not only are you actually getting everything cross-checked by the 40 Guard Labs, but the information is actually being, well, we don't actually send it to the Cyber Threat Alliance. We actually download the databases from the Cyber Threat Alliance, and our advanced threat products actually cross-reference the other vendors' databases as well. So that doesn't necessarily mean we're sending files out into these public kind of uh, threat sharing forums. This is really based around metadata and secured information. So that's just a bit of background, you know, in regards to our pedigree with threat intelligence. Um, again, I'd like to say I've worked with Interpol and NATO directly, but it's mainly my team. They're far more superiorly intelligent than myself. But yet we have a, you know, we have a strong pedigree. We also, well, I like to, even though we don't actually make a big noise about it, uh, I like to kind of point out the fact that back in about 2012, 2013, we were big advocates of the MITRE attack framework. So obviously that's uh, an open uh, framework for kind of information threat mapping and threat sharing. And we were quite adamant that no vendor should really have any framework that's specific to themselves. So our view was, you know, with APIs, sticks, taxi, all the open standards and protocols that are out there today, you know, the vendors should be able to interoperate and work with each other without actually having anything too exclusive. So, you know, the MITRE attack framework, Interpol, MITRE Ingenuity, the Atlas framework, this is all kind of open standards and frameworks that we work on and have contributed towards. So that's just the background in regards to what Fortinet have done with threat intelligence. So I'm just checking the time. Um, so, okay, traditional threat intelligence flow. So really, I mean, to be honest, sometimes it's, every vendor kind of will say the same thing, look, we're brilliant at threat intelligence. So I prefer to skip past that part and to actually then look at, you know, how things are changing. So traditionally, the responsibility of the threat intelligence feed or where your organizations or where your peers actually receive the threat intelligence information from is normally handled by your SOC. And a lot of our end users, a lot of the enterprise customers actually don't necessarily manage their own SOC. They'll work with the third party potentially. So irrespective of if you're running an in-house SOC or an outhouse SOC, the responsibility of actually understanding the threat intelligence that surrounds your digital world is the responsibility of either your security operations team or your SOC center. So, you know, with that in mind, if we look at our, you know, critical, so I mean, our, today, on today's modern landscape, really our biggest, you know, asset 
information is also our greatest vulnerability as well. And that information obviously resides with our digital assets. So our digital assets are obviously under constant attack by the threat actors. And again, like I said, being lucky enough to work with the threat intelligence teams. So crime as a service, ransomware, we're all familiar with that, you know, the business models that actually surround cybercrime. But over the last few years, we've, well, actually over the last two to three years, we've seen a huge kind of shift in the geopolitical landscape. So I had to submit these slides last week. So, you know, I'm not saying that politicians are threat actors. Uh, certainly, I'm not saying that's the case after November the 5th. And, you know, like I said, I submit these slides last week, so I didn't, you know, my, my claim in regards to geopolitical links with threat actors was made before the big election that everyone's talking about at the moment. But that's something that we've seen. Whereas before, threat actor motivations were quite straightforward, especially when it came to actually crimes, crime as a service uh, and ransomware models and the way the things were operated on the dark web. We have seen kind of these holy or unholy, un unholy alliances in regards to geopolitical motivations um, of the threat actor groups. So whereas before they would be on opposing sides of the actual state and law enforcement agencies, they're actually kind of, we're seeing a big shift with that. So, you know, geopolitical activism is heavily linked in now and embedded with what the threat actor motivations are. And obviously the target of the threat actors are your digital assets. And like I said, the responsibility to actually defend your threat, uh, um, digital assets typically lies with your SOC or your security operations team. So in regards to um, giving, so th the SOCs are overloaded. It goes without saying that our security operations teams are massively under pressure, we're understaffed. There's a huge skills gap. This is something that we're all aware of. This is something I'm constantly getting in trouble with HR about where um, I'm having to interview people half my age. Who want, well, being half my age is quite easy. But people wanting double my salary, um, that's a bit of a challenge. And actually then trying to give positive and constructive feedback to HR without actually sounding insulting is, is a bit difficult. But um, we're understaffed, right? We're, so the SOC teams are hugely under pressure. And um, so they re will rely, uh, the SOC team, cyber defense, it's all kind of synonymous. They rely on the threat intelligence providers to actually then feed the IOCs into the threat intelligence platform and typically, it has been the responsibility of the SOC, the security operations team, to actually take that threat intel and, you know, have a huge amount of trust there. So they'll trust the threat intel they receive, contextualize it into the world of the digital assets of the organization, and then uh, disseminate that information at strategic, tactical, and operation levels within the organization. So if the SOC teams are overloaded, you know, that's a really big responsibility for them to kind of undertake. And whereas previously we had specialist vendors in threat intelligence platform technologies, We've seen that slowly be absorbed now by SIM and SOAR platforms, so the data lakes. So th these are traditionally referred to as the, you know, well, a SIM and SOAR really, if you kind of compress the two together, every vendor has a fancy acronym or name for it. But in essence, you know, they are the digital data lake of your organization. So the, the threat intelligence platforms have been absorbed by SIM and SOAR platforms into then uh, building these data lakes, but it still is the responsibility of your SOC team or security operations team. So the threat intel provider, so that's a big you know, trust uh, responsibility and relationship in the first place, feeds the IOCs, these little fragments of threat intel into the data lake, and it's the responsibility of the SOC. Um, so we saw the, the, the two fin agents, so we have something similar where you know, the the AI assistants can read into the data lakes, but it is still a lot of, irrespective of the AI and automation that's been embedded into the data lake, there's still a lot of work for the SOC to do. So we've seen that world change now, simply because the, 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 um, same, the, the SecOps and the SOC teams can't cope with that. So what we've seen threat intelligence move to is a contextualized model now. So no longer are the SOC teams actually then having to receive that information and then contextualize it, that responsibility of contextualized threat, intel uh, threat intelligence is being offloaded to specific vendors or specific providers of that technology. So if we look at traditional uh, security operations platform, so that circle in the middle, imagine that to be your cyber defense team. So no longer are we finding organizations saying, okay, I'm gonna receive a huge kind of tsunami of data and threat intel actually being fed into my security operations team. I need that responsibility offloaded to somebody else. <coughs> So and if you think about it, it's no longer just about IOCs. Like there's geopolitical uh, activism, crime as a service, but it's much bigger than that. So dark web, you know, data dumps, uh, credential kind of monitoring, sea level staff monitoring, and the bit that we're all concerned about nowadays is the digital supply chain. So yes, you know, your you can draw your digital boundary around your assets, but what about your critical business partners? 
and having to actually then receive those information feeds and updates from them. So if you can't put all of that into the plate of the SOC, it's simply overwhelming for them. So more and more we're finding organizations actually offloading that responsibility onto threat intel providers and using products something like 40 Recon. So I mean, 40 Recon is obviously the Fortinet platform, but the actual space itself is referred to as the digital risk protection space. And this is where organizations and security operations centers are actually going to vendors or providers of digital risk protection solutions and saying, look, it's your responsibility. It's overwhelming for us. You know, the old model of just consuming a raw threat feed of 100 to 200,000 IOCs on a daily basis and actually trying to make sense of that is simply overwhelming for us. And they, you know, the, the attack surface is just massive. So that responsibility is being overloaded. And you know, that's really considered to be kind of pre-breach. So I know it's an old one, but um, if you remember in 2000, May 2021, you had the Colonial Pipeline breach, where they shut down 5,500 miles worth of um, oil pipeline in the US, and the kind of there's all those apocalyptic pictures of people queuing up at the uh, gas stations, as they call them, but obviously the real name is petrol stations. So the, um, you know, there's all these pictures and whatever. And so every vendor, including us, we made a big fuss. Oh, it was um, IoT critical national infrastructure specific uh, ransomware, which it was, but the actual entry level for that breach were layer three VPN credentials. It was a username and password for a VPN that was sold on the dark web. Obviously there was no multi-factor authentication and then you know, the breach took place. And okay, that was 2021. Uh, we had something very similar happen. So it's under investigation at the moment, but I can't talk about it too much. Obviously some of us were nearly impacted by it today. The tube strike was called off, but the TFL breach, from a few weeks ago, or I think a month or so ago, that itself was also, the, the strong suspicion on that were layer three VPN credentials being traded on the dark web uh, and, and you being used as an entry point. Whereas with the Colonial Pipeline breach, it was a dark side ransomware group. This time it was, a, at the moment, it looks like it was a lone wolf, a 17 year old from I think Walsall or Leicestershire. So, I mean, in regards to the actual threat intelligence kind of platform, so that's the security operations. Threat intelligence has now been contextualized. Yes, we have you know, the data lake. So like I was saying, you have the SIM and the SOAR platforms where all the information for your organization is fed into, and you have these nice AI chatbots that provide this intelligent interface. So they'll support your SOC. So the SOC will actually then be able to, so you can have a junior analyst now in your SOC, then actually read into the data lake with more human-like queries. So obviously, like I said, these expensive threat analysts, half your age, well, half my age, wanting double the salary with these, um, Obviously, there's no offense if you're a threat analyst sitting in the audience, but I'm just talking about my team here. Um, but, you know, they, 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 they bring with them a huge amount of experience, but now with these kind of uh, AI-assisted bots that can actually read into these huge um, uh, you know, mountains of information with a more human-like interface, you're able to extract that information and have it enriched by threat intel providers, but it's still reactive, isn't it? If something is sitting in your data lake, digitally it's transacted. It's taken place and you're then retrospectively extracting that information. Whereas contextual threat intelligence is now actually being proactive and actually having research teams out on the dark web, out in the digital space, looking at your organization from the outside looking in as a digital asset and offering protection from that space. So that's where we are in regards to threat intelligence. We have a stand, uh, myself and the Fortinet team are here for the day. Uh, if you want to go through any one of these technologies in any further detail, feel free to have a conversation with us. But I hope you found that useful. I hope you had a lovely day and um, thank you for your time.